Well, hey, everybody, good morning. Thanks for tuning in for The Daily Word. My name is Kyle. I'm one of the pastors here at Redeemer, and we are gonna actually be jumping into a new book study this morning. So for the last week and a half or so, we have been going through the book of Hebrews, and I, I have really enjoyed that study with you. I hope you have as well. Uh, but we're gonna be moving on this morning to the book of James. So if you are at all familiar with James, this is a wonderfully encouraging book. Uh, a couple of cool historical points and backgrounds from the book of James. Uh, James is actually probably the very first book of the New Testament that was written. So if we have the crucifixion around AD 33, uh, most of Paul's writings start around AD 50 and go through about AD 68. And the book of James here was written somewhere between AD 40 and 45. So pretty soon after uh, the events of the crucifixion and, the, and Pentecost, the founding of the church, James, the, the half-brother of Jesus, uh, was also one of the leaders in the church in Jerusalem. And so as the church in Jerusalem is being built up, they need an instruction manual for godly living, some apostolic instruction. So here we go. That's what we get in the book of James. Audience is the, the church in Jerusalem. That's the original audience. And this is one of the earliest things that we can know from uh, instruction from God direct to the church. So it says here, verse 1, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. So this is, this is to the church in Jerusalem and to those Jews who have been dispersed either through persecution or through just uh, uh, moving around the empire. Okay, it says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So our first bit of instruction is encouragement to persevere under trials, knowing that God has a plan to bring about spiritual growth in their life. And he says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. What a, what a great reminder. If you lack wisdom, wisdom, remember when Solomon asked God for something, God granted him anything. He said, just give me the wisdom to lead your people. And God lavished wisdom on him because wisdom is the knowledge of God's word rightly understood and rightly applied. So if we're lacking in that, we can pray to the Lord for wisdom and he'll give it to us. It says, who gives generously without reproach that it may be given, but he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable. That's a, a, you know, Christians, our idea of faith is faith fixed in the person and work of Jesus Christ and of God our Father, who is unchanging and who is all-sufficient. So why would we ever doubt the goodness of our Father when we're asking for a good and righteous gift? So he goes on, but brother, the humble circumstance, the, but the brother of humble circumstance is to glory in his high position, and the rich is, is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass, he will pass away. And this is an interesting statement, because the, the poor man humble, uh, 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 of humble circumstance is to glory in his high position. What does that mean? Well, this is the idea that Paul is, is, is drawing a line between the middle of the, the poor man and the rich man, saying, the poor man can glory in his high circumstance of being in Christ, of being saved. And the rich man can be humbled in his position, not of being wealthy and important in, in the world, but in, in, in being a humble servant of Christ. And those two things meet in the middle from the vast divide of wealth, right? We're all one in Christ. We're all blessed in our high position in Christ. And we're all humble as servants of Christ as well. And then we get into some more instruction here, really, in verse 12. But blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Um, when, when we have trials, remember he began by saying, rejoice when you encounter various trials, for, for uh, the testing, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So we know this, the knowledge of the truth sets us knowing that God is, is organizing and orchestrating things for our growth and for our benefit. So then the one who perseveres, he says, the one who perseveres and, 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 and uh, is triumphant through trial will receive the crown of life that God has promised. This is that salvation that God has promised. And, and then uh, as a side note, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. 
This is the whole process, right? God is not the one tempting us. Our own flesh tempts us. God directs our steps, and when we pray and ask for protection and wisdom to stay away from those things, he will guide our steps away from those things as we fight past it. When we give in, we, we shouldn't be surprised when, when uh, we're enticed by our own lusts. So he says, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no shifting shadow. In contrast to, no, God doesn't tempt you. Instead, every good thing you have comes from him. Let's, let's keep a right perspective on who the Father is. Uh, and in the exercise of his will, he will, uh, he, uh, his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. This is just God working out his plan in people here. So more instruction. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear slow to speak and slow to anger. And what does the flesh want to do? Be quick to speak, be quick to judge, be quick to angry. Anger, biblical anger, is a negative moral judgment, a righteous judgment against somebody else. And mostly for us, an unrighteous judgment against somebody else. So we're, we don't want to be quick to that. Because he says, the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So, uh, righteous anger achieves the righteousness of God. And we can be angry about the things that God is angry about in the sense that we are perceiving a negative moral judgment, not in the sense that we're executing wrath, but in the sense that we're indignant against sin and in a, in a way that leads us to draw people to repentance and faith in Christ. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. This is such great, simple instruction. Put aside sin and, and, and take in the word. Uh, and, and then, of course, but prove yourselves to be doers of the word and not merely hearers only. That's that, that, the, the thought that many will profess Christ. Many will say that they're Christians, but in reality, they reject the word because they do not be practiced. The, the, the word is full of what we call indicative and imperative commands. These are, these, are this, these things you must do, and these are the, thing, the characteristics of a Christian. This is who you must be in Christ because uh, in your... Um, practice of your faith, the, the fruits of the Spirit will come out. And it says, but prove yourself to be doers of the word. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he's looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgot the person that who he was. The Spirit, or I'm sorry, the word is a mirror reflecting onto you what you are to be. And then you walk away and just forget it. You're like, no, I don't need to do that. I don't want to do that. Um, instead, uh, that person forgets. Uh, but, but one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. He's like the guy who looks and is told what to do and, and, and sees it and then puts it into practice, puts it into uh, his life, and he'll be blessed by that. God wants to see those righteous fruits come out of us because he wants to bless us in those things. And then if anyone thinks himself to be religious, yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Here we have summed up the law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. If you think you're religious, but you can't even control your tongue, this little muscle that directs your whole body out of the mouth, the heart speaks, then your religion is worthless. Don't tell me that you're a religious person who loves the Lord when out of your mouth, your heart is spewing forth wickedness. Instead, pure and undefiled in the religion in the sight of our God and Father is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He's saying, visit orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself unstained by the world. Love your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do you see that? That's just a beautiful, wonderful summary statement. And what a great opening chapter to the book of James. I hope that's encouraging to you. hope that makes sense to you. Uh, if you ever have any questions, if the church can help you in any way, uh, email us at info at redeemeraz.org. Uh, again, my name is Kyle, one of the pastors here at Redeemer. I'll continue with you tomorrow in James chapter 2. Thanks for joining us this morning.